Right, Roger. I'm going to put to you that 1984 is one of the best years ever for filmmaking and film goers. Not just because of the recent Wonder Woman movie you mentioned, obviously as part of uh, the content creator shout but 1984 saw the release of Purple Rain, Gremlins, Temple of Doom, Karate Kid, Terminator, Neverending Story, Revenge of the Nerds, <laughs> Dune. But more importantly, 1984 saw the release of Ghostbusters. Ah, Ghostbusters and the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. That Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man was actually quite scary, despite the fact that it was basically just a great big white Michelin man with a with a with a hat on, towering above the of the city. Uh, yeah, I mean, 1984. Lots of memories from the point of view of childhood. Lots of memories from the point of view of being at school, but lots of great music in the charts as well. Mm -hmm. That was probably the pinnacle of 1980s music around that time as well, wasn't it? And of course, not only was Ghostbusters a great film, but it also had an amazing, amazing theme tune, which I think got into the top 10, if not topped the top 10 in the charts as well. So good film, good soundtrack. Yeah, and for me, uh, I probably got to listen to the song for many weeks and months before we managed to go to the movies and see the film. So by the time we went to see Ghostbusters, I was about to implode with joy when the movie <laughs> starts with the song that you heard on the radio for weeks and months, you know, Ray Parker Jr. Who, and and I think we would learn the lines of the, the, the song by heart, I'm sure. It's one of those embarrassing <laughs> examples of being in the cinema and people actually shouting out Ghostbusters at the appropriate <laughs> point during the song. And, and they actually, you know, apart from the usual crunching of popcorn and, and snapping of um, uh, hot dogs and stuff like that, most people sit and watch films quite quietly, except during songs like Ghostbusters, and they're all shouting it out. And you're almost like, should I be joining in with this? Or I probably was joining in, actually, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, this movie uh, has everything. It's got obviously comedy with some, you know, the superb um, actors. It's got elements of horror. It's got elements, obviously, of special effects, which back in the days looked, you know, really, really, really impressive. But it was also one where, you know, we saw a different side of New York, which uh, oddly, most films are filmed in and around California and Los Angeles and so on. And this was actually, for me, certainly as a young moviegoer, so, uh, you know, New York in a different light altogether yeah i mean even films that are purported to be in new york often tend to be filmed elsewhere don't they like vancouver pretending to be new york mm. or or chicago pretending to be new york but to, to actually genuinely see it in danger was actually quite good so I don't know whether there are people out there um, alive who have not seen Ghostbusters. I don't think that's possible. But um, just in case you know you haven't and you are following this review and this comment on the marketing of the film, you feel like watching it, you, you're in for, for, for a treat. Um, interestingly, the the movie, the final version, had a lot of scenes deleted. And, and mm -hmm. I'm still longing for the director's cut, whatever term you want to use, Roger, to see the full version of the film. Uh, this movie was meant to be for adults only. Well, because you had Bill Murray, because you had Dana Croyd, Harold Ramis, and and the others who are really started life as stand-up comedians with, uh, well, a, a language that was really for, for adults. And some of the jokes in the film sometimes let parents little little concerned about, you know, having their kids, kids in the theatre rooms as well. Yeah, because... I actually always quite like those films where they're almost playing to two different audiences. I used to like that when I was taking my son to the cinema and we used to go and see a film, maybe a cartoon like Up or something like that, where mainly the jokes and the and the storyline were aimed at children. But some of the some of the dialogue and some of the jokes are just a little bit above the kids' heads. But we, we but we know what it means. We know what it means. And and yeah, this this is just taking it that little step further but i didn't know what you just said there that it was originally aimed at being a, a more adult movie and i and i didn't know that it was a load of deleted stuff as well i wonder whether that actually still exists or the reason we haven't got a director's cut is because it genuinely has disappeared forever 
Yeah, you can you can get access to some uh, if you have the special edition DVD or Blu-ray, but there isn't like a constructed film with all, all, all the extra scenes. And I always think that in the context of watching it at home, that, that would be just brilliant to see that to see that the full version. So. I mean, there's also uh, other characters. I mean, people remember primarily, obviously, um, the four, you know, kind of Ghostbusters t together with uh, Ernie Hudson. But I love Rick Moranis in that film. Uh, each time I watch it and he comes on screen playing this kind of goofy, geeky accountant, I literally cry with laughter. Yeah, we all, we all knew somebody at school who <laughs> was like that, had the glasses and had the goofy aspect about them. And I'm pretty sure that for probably about 18 months after Ghostbusters came out, whoever that individual at school was effectively got <laughs> yeah. uh, caricatured by what we'd seen on screen. For the producers and directors, I think it was quite a coup to get Sigourney Weaver to agree to be in a you know really kind of a comedy, horror comedy. And she really, really uh, went for it. Uh, I think she, she was just pleased to be asked and playing uh, what we, would be called Zool, the gatekeeper. You know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Zool, I remember that. And, and of course, she was famous around that time because of aliens and everything mm. like that. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. She was a, a bit of a, a steal for the producers there. What what I like about about the film as well is that the the, the acting and the actors just go for it. You know, they they don't hold back, and I think that would have been uh, quite enjoyable for the director, uh, even or Ivan Reitman. But um, if you look at uh, the special effects and the, the behind the scenes stuff, because by and large, you know, Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd were comedians they never never followed the script were improvising all the time mm -hmm. so part of it must have been a nightmare to direct but also you probably got a better result for it i think that you can i mean I, I, as a director yourself you'll know what it must be like to have out of control uh, actors <laughs> uh, but yeah I'm, I'm sure that they ended up with a better film as a result of that but i imagine at the time you know the controlling those two on set must have been an absolute nightmare. And again, there must be some incredible outtakes I would have expected yeah. from the filming of this where they perhaps went a little bit too far or they effed and blinded a little bit too much or something. And I'd love to see some of that footage. So, I mean, it's hard to, to suggest to you that Ghostbuster was the, the best film of 1984. It's tricky because what is the measure? But what I will say is when we used to be able to go to a Comic-Con um, in London and other places, there was always a group of people dressed as the Ghostbusters with the proton packs and you know and and the kind of the traps and so on walking around the the, the kind of the convention centers because it's left an, an impact you know, not just in terms of the film but also the look the merchandising the the logo I think people know what the Ghostbusters logo is around the world right oh yeah I mean it's it's so iconic and again so simple. And it, it, it's and it's a badge as well, isn't it? It's mm. I mean I mean all logos can be badges, but this one was almost designed to be a badge, in my opinion. It was it was perfect. Interesting, you made the comment about you know the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man that attacks <laughs> the building very much like King Kong. And I mean, I think it works. I think by the time you get to that point of, of the movie, you, you're ready to accept any kind of uh, silliness and, and comedy. But the directors actually were quite worried that it would not work. So they had actually uh, other endings, including a big, big old fight, a proper normal fight against uh, Goza, the ruler of the sixth dimension. But um, I'm glad they kept it with the Marshmallow Man. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because at the time, my elder sister had just moved to America. Well, she'd, she'd moved to America a few years earlier. And I think the state, I might be wrong with this, and, and if I'm wrong, please put a comment in below. I think the Stay, Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man is actually based on the Pillsbury Dough Man, which was a similar, if, if not identical looking uh, character. And I imagine that they either decided not to try and license the Pillsbury Dough Man to use in the movie, or the makers of Pillsbury Dough didn't want the risk of the brand reputation of of portraying the Pillsbury Dough Man as a great big monster ransacking and destroying New York. 
might have had a detrimental effect on their brand. So they mm. came up with the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, which everybody knew was the Pillsbury Dough Man, but didn't really want to admit it. Um, and, and if I'm wrong about that, then I apologise. But that, that, that was what stuck in my mind. But a, a, a great climax to the film when, when something so bizarrely odd can actually look so actually quite terrifying. So much so that, um, I mean, what I will say very, ever so briefly, Roger, in the context of this segment, I didn't think the sequel was as good, you know, Ghostbusters 2, but I'm very much looking forward to Ghostbusters Afterlife. That's what mm -hmm. happens to be directed by the son of Ivan Reitman, uh. Jason Reitman. And, and I don't know, I, I just got a feeling that it's going to really, really work, all, all that nostalgia, and of course, celebrating uh, a movie that was made you know, such a long time ago. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. So we better talk about the marketing <laughs> of it, hadn't we, as well? <laughs> we should. But do you know what, what was interesting? As I was remembering Ghostbusters and chuckling to myself as I was going through the scenes that happens, I think, to be fair, um, Bill Murray probably got all the best lines in, in the films, but um, his exchange with all the other characters, including uh, Sigourney Weaver, who he's trying to seduce throughout the whole film, uh, is great. But I was wondering whether Ghostbusters, as well as being a horror comedy, Roger, is it also a film about building and marketing a new business. <laughs> Ooh. Well, because if you think about it, we've got uh, friends who've lost their jobs because essentially they were incompetent. They lost their job from university and they borrow money by remortgaging, I think, Dan Aykroyd's mother's house. Yeah, they yeah, then went yeah. to rent a derelict building because that's what they could afford. They invest in TV advertising very, very smartly. So they get that, uh, that TV adverts that the character Sigourney Weaver uh, gets to see. They buy a second-hand vehicle that becomes the um, famous Ecto-1. They get their first high-profile uh, client by trashing the hotel, if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> and then they get into the press, and then everything becomes um, you know, history, and they become a successful um, business. But because they are successful, then they have to face bureaucracy. And then we have the character of Walt Peck, who tries to obviously stop them, and obviously it creates, you know, the, the problem that you see at the end of the film. I just think it's kind of interesting that we see the journey of the start of business as well as watching Ghostbusters. Hadn't really thought about <laughs> it like that, Pascal. So congratulations for unraveling such a such deep meaning in in the but you're absolutely right you're i mean when we talk about marketing the films i, I actually think about the you know the, the poster campaigns yes. uh like the, the the no ghosts logo and and the strap line coming to save the world this summer um and you know revealing the ecto-1 in manhattan but of course yeah you're, you're absolutely right the, we can learn me marketing messages from the construction of the film and and the story that you've yeah. here we go stories again the story you've just taken us through those steps is is absolutely so are we going to suggest lessons. to our viewers and listeners that to learn more about marketing you have to watch watch ghostbusters as well as read uh, you know much more important books about marketing Absolutely. You could probably learn more from watching Ghostbusters than you can from buying a $47 course, if truth be told. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me about the No Ghost, no ghost um, poster, because when this was released, there, there was nothing else to go with it. That must have been so intriguing uh, and, and exciting at the time, you know, when mm. people saw, well, what is it? What's coming? And I wonder whether we don't have enough of that nowadays, you know, that sense of intrigue. I wonder whether sometimes everything, so much is revealed so early that for us as film goers or TV series viewers, we don't have the same sense of excitement. Yeah, I think the problem these days is it's, you have to reveal it early because it's impossible to keep it secret um, <laughs> because it'll always get leaked either deliberately or by accident. Um, but yeah, I think we, we probably do lose some of that anticipation as a result from the one that i remember as a marketing tactic is the fact that they actually had a real number to ring yeah to call ghostbusters i mean ultimately the song was you know who are you going to call you know ghostbusters. ghostbusters and actually you could you could call them right yeah yeah i, I mean that's again bit of genius maybe that could be the first example of that, that actually happening in a film and being part of the marketing. Ever since then, of course, we've had more dial-in TV shows and, and you know, you'll also often see telephone numbers appear on on films 
And I've tried phoning a few of these numbers just to see if they have put an answering machine on it or a message. And sometimes they have, which is is really funny. But I'm thinking back, that's probably the fir- one of the first times that that had actually been done as almost like part of the plot, as part of the experience. And I would just love to know how many people actually phoned that number. Yeah, but there's not just that. I mean, if you imagine, so not only could you hear the voices of, at the time, Dana Croyd and Bill Murray, who were really, you know, famous in the US, but then you would tell your friends, right? You would say, my God, yeah. just a moment ago. So your friend's got a ring. So that kind yeah. of word of mouth marketing, of our marketing, as you mentioned a moment ago, is probably true. And so much so that um, that song, or, or certainly the, the word, who are you going to call call Ghost, Ghostbusters, has been used by other brands in, mm-hmm. in, in their own marketing as, as a bit of an, I don't know if it was an homage or, or plagiarism, but uh, many, many um, years ago, when I used to work in travel, and my wife Denise worked in travel as well, she worked for a tour operator called Cosmos. So you may vaguely remember, I think they were based not far from me actually, mm. in, the, in the north of, of the UK. And I think in the late 80s, they had a big campaign where it was literally, who are you going to call, called Cosmos, not Ghostbusters. Yes. But they were not the only one. You know, I think that you just you had that um, rhythm that people could kind of piggyback on. Yeah, I, I- these, there's even been something recently which it was was something busters. It was as blatant <laughs> as that, you know, dust busters or something like that, as opposed to ghost busters. But I've definitely, definitely heard it done recently. So when you create a song like that that becomes embedded within the whole marketing ethos of the film, it's bound to get copied and replicated over the years. But it's still. Go. It's it's a bit like we said early on about John Logie Baird inventing the TV. So many marketing campaigns and so many successful brands and products can probably trace their way back to this particular film and back to this particular song. It, it's I love that that sort of family tree mm. image that that you've created today in this uh, in this podcast. No, absolutely, and and I know that through my own research, you know, I discovered something which is very much in the business of filmmaking and and film going, where there there are there used to be regular conventions where the owners of movie chains or um, theatre chains would be pitched by the different you know creators um, before obviously you had a virtual integration. So what they did do was actually a advert, advert where the characters from Ghostbusters would address via video the owners of different. Uh, movie chains to <laughs> tell them to make sure they would show Ghostbusters. I just think you know this. This is a different time, 1984, where you had to ask the owners of the different cinema chains to make sure your film was featured. Yeah, you just you would have just thought it was an automatic thing. No, there wasn't. You had to kind of negotiate, which is I think yeah. um, quite interesting. So yeah, I mean, not only is it a, a fantastic film to watch as a family, and as we mentioned a moment ago, the adults will laugh at things that the, the kids will miss completely, uh, and vice vice versa. But there's a lot of lessons about you know that era, in 1980s. You know what was available to you in terms of marketing. It was really practical form of marketing. But oddly, the the characters themselves and the movie itself has lessons in marketing as well, which is something that I never thought of until a few days ago. No, it's uh, that's why I, that's why I love this film marketing segment so much because we get to talk about some of the best films of all time. But we can always, I mean, I'm absolutely blown away by that whole storyline thing that you brought out here about building a business and doing all of the things like facing bureaucracy. Absolute genius, Pascal. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So, Roger, it is time to bring episode 25 to a close. Sadly, we could talk more about whether 1984 was the best year in terms of film and whether Ghostbusters was indeed the best horror comedy of all times. Can I thank you again for being such a wonderful co-host and for all the time you spent on research. And to you, our viewers and listeners, thank you for your amazing support. I was Pascal Fintoni and he was Roger Edwards. Until the next one, go out there and make sure your marketing is done right. Right.